from here okay? All right, we'll, we'll try to remember to yell louder than they are down the hallway. Um, so I'm going to call us to order at 7.01. And there is a sign-in uh, sign sheet going around, so if everyone could please be sure to sign in so we can keep track of who was here, we'd appreciate that. And before we get started with the renovation portion, um, Fred Baser is going to take literally three minutes, he promised me, the other day. <laughs> to give us a, a brief update on the changes that Montpelier is considering. And I'm going to ask that you hold questions regarding what Fred has to say until the end so that we can stay on track for this meeting. <coughs> All right. So Fred. OK. Thank you. Literally two and a half hours ago, um, Ways and Means voted out a new tax bill, which includes uh, a new formula for funding public education. Um, it's a pretty considerable change, all in all. Is my three minutes up already? <laughs> no, all the time. I'm going to go through the tax bill because the uh, education funding piece ties into it. Um, we're going to go to a federal AGI for taxation rather than taxable state income. In other words, your federal adjusted gross income will be what your income tax is based on moving forward, with a few exceptions. There'll be a $6,000 standard deduction, and there'll be a Vermont personal exemption of $4,150. We're going to cap charitable contributions at 5% to a maximum of 10 grand. That means a $500 credit will be applied um, to the first $10,000 made to people in charitable deductions, anything above that, it's on you. Uh, changes, uh, we're changing the income tax brackets. All the brackets will be reduced by 0.2% for all the various brackets, which don't change much. And it creates an exemption for Social Security benefits to people making up to, up to 70 grand, which is a really good thing, I think, that's in the bill. Then what happened is we created a new surcharge, income tax surcharge, to fund education. The surcharge is modest. What it's to raise is about 59 to 60 million. The thinking was walk slowly rather than run. Um, it would be a 0.1% for the first 31,650 for joint, a little bit more for for single people, a half a percent between the mid-30s up to 116, <coughs> and then uh, one percent on incomes of over $116,000. Um, the 60 million approximately that's being raised by income tax will go to reduce your property tax, specifically the property tax that uh, education funding comes from. Not your total to the property tax bill, but that <coughs> consists of education and also municipal. Um, the current income sensitivity that we have will be maintained. Uh, so will a renter rebate that's been in existence for some time, as well as a homeowner rebate for those people that own a home and have incomes of $47,000 or less. That's the changes in a nutshell. Not sexy stuff. Um, uh, and I'm not sure whether this will pass through the Senate and, uh, and be signed by the governor. It wouldn't surprise me at all if there'll be changes along the way. But all tax initiatives come from the House. Um, and uh, this emerged from the Ways and Means Committee, um, again, late afternoon. I'm glad I had something to report. I almost emailed you and said I wasn't going to come. <laughs> but we're running into deadlines concerning bills having to reach a certain point in order for them to reach the end by the end of the session. And uh, so it was important that something happened, otherwise nothing would. So there it is in a nutshell. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. See, I told you I could do it in three minutes. You did, right on time, too. <laughs> Um, and now I'm, we're going to start the presentation about the um, information regarding the bond to uh, 
pay for the renovation of the Mount Abraham building, and Don Griswold, board chair of Mount Abraham board, and many others, is going to start us off. <laughs> Did you want a minute to introduce your committee? Oh, uh, we could do that too. So uh, some of the renovation committee members are here tonight. Um, so if we could start at that end, just to introduce. Uh, Dustin Corrigan, Bristol, and I'm a physical education teacher here at Mount Abraham. Bob Patterson, Little Lincoln. Peter Zalonis, live here in the village. Chris Pearsall from Bristol, I was the chair of this committee. Allison Sturdivant from Bristol. I'm Brad Johnson from Starksboro. Denise Dalton from Moncton. Welcome everyone, Jess Barrowitz, principal, and I live in Moncton. Alright, so as um, Chris said, I'm John Griswold, I'm the chair of the Mount Abraham board and I live in Moncton. Um, so, so we got some light. So, <laughs> so here's a peek sort of at what the renovation might look like. Um, you know, it's, um, it's just, you know, a picture to give you sort of an idea of what we're talking about here. Can everybody see? Yes, that's better. Alright. Here's, here's our topics for tonight. We're going to talk about the building today, the opportunity that this proposed bond project gives us, the cost, and then allow for some questions and the answers. Okay. So, here's some things we know. The building opened in the fall of 1968, and there are still people in our community who will probably remember that, that building opening, moving from the little the high school more in the center of town to out here. Uh, con construction was completed in the fall of 1969. Um, and then we have some other notable <coughs> renovations that took place. The South End Edition, uh, what they call the Middle School Edition, was completed in 2005. The wood chip plant boiler in 2007. And in 2016, we had the entire gym floor replaced. The other great news is we currently have no debt. So here's our little, let's see if I can, uh, plaque from there with our uh, founding year. And um, just some pictures of the outside of the building. And the pictures probably don't do it as much justice as, as if you've walked outside and walked around the building. You can see the deterioration of the, the bricks, um, especially around the pool area. You can see the effects of the pool water that has permeated through the bricks to the outside, you can see it, the effect of it there. Um, here's some of our smaller, narrow windows that are on the front of the building. When you drive up, you, you see this. And the building today, um, there are accessibility challenges. Um, little daylight due to the lack of windows. There are some um, court the lack of windows and the poor daylight you see you can really see in the pass-through classrooms. That's a classroom sandwiched between two other classrooms that has no outside wall, no outside light. Um, we have some poor air, air circulation, plumbing concerns, and security concerns. That's the back of the building and, and up there you can kind of see the, the damage to, that's showing on the bricks. Um, near the pool. Some more about the building. The restrooms and locker rooms are in poor condition. Um, many of the parts of that are original condition and have been scrubbed and cleaned and to the very end of their life. Um, we have gym scheduling challenges and if you're a parent who has somebody in a high school sport, particularly in a winter sport, you could be driving your student down here at 6 o'clock in the morning for a practice. Or you could be driving back down here at 9 o'clock to pick them up when they finish a practice. And sometimes they don't finish at 9 o'clock, sometimes they finish at 9.30. And sometimes, if you're really lucky, you get a practice that ends at 9.30 and you have to be back at 6. So, <laughs> um, it's just the gym is used all day and for gym classes and then after school for other activities. Uh, there are tra traffic flow concerns. If you've been out front when the buses pick up at the end of the day, you've experienced, experienced that. The buses line up out in front of the building, and there's that little sort of cut around that occasionally you can get through, but there's kids passing. It's really not a safe situation to have parents 
who pick up trying to get by the buses and the kids. And so uh, another issue we have is no sprinkler system. The auditorium is at the end of its life and uh, we have outdated science labs. Our, uh, our opportunity. This bond project will um, allow us the opportunity to create a facility that reflects the pride <coughs> our, our community has in its students. It will reflect the great work happening here at Mount Abe and improve some outcomes for our students. Uh, as well as provide a safe and functioning building for the decades to come. Also, improve environmental health and security. Um, security we've mentioned and <coughs> haven't said uh, much about, but if you, if you notice when you come in the main door, there's a small door on the side, and during the school day, the, the out exterior doors are locked, and if you want to get in, you have to, to bu buzz yourself in, but once you open that door, You've got free reign. We're relying on you to come to the office and tell us why you're here. And if somebody didn't care to do that or had other intentions, they're in the building at that point and loose in the building. Uh, so there's a pre improved energy efficiency in this pro project, a second gym, and, and it'll improve what the community thinks. Um, if you hear people, you might hear people driving up for a sporting event who say, kind of looks like a prison, kind of looks like, you know, it's not, not, it's not a friendly looking place. <laughs> Before they even get in the door to meet us, they've already made a decision. Don, I think it's, uh, it's turn. Yeah, it's, we decided to uh, mix it up a little bit uh, mm -hmm. rather than have just Patrick make the whole presentation as he did last time. But anyway, as I said before, my name is Brad Johnson. I live in Starks Bar with my wife and, and two children, um, one of whom is here in, in, in the room who will be attending uh, Mount Abe as a ninth grader in the fall. The other one still has a few years left to go. But, I, but it's nice, the nice segue from the last slide, I'm talking about the you know, community perceptions and the, and the sort of the role of the community and, and, and the interplay between the community and, and the school. Um, I think that you know, we've been, the renovation committee has been, has been meeting for um, the last eight or nine months and one of the main themes, I think, that was at least compelling to me, was the uh, you know was this interplay between the community and the school, and what the school means for the community, and what this and what the community means um, for the school. I think it goes without saying that you know that in, in, in smaller communities like ours, the school a school is the natural sort of um, you know, sort of center of many kinds of activities. Um, you know, so we see. You know, the, you know this, again, this interplay really kind of takes two forms, one of which is you know, kind of what's happening tonight, you know, sports activities, other, um, I mean, I'm sure all of us have attended um, you know, the, the, the performances in the, in the auditorium. Um, there, there are you know, other community events that take place in the, in the school. The, um, you know, the, the, we, we have the only high school in the state that has a pool, and, and, and the pool is accessible to the community. And so it, the point is, is that the, 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 how the school interacts with the school is, is of, I think, um, tremendous you know, you know, interest to the community. In fact, some of you may have attended a meeting in early January about community members, which, and the theme of that meeting was how do we increase you know, sort of community involvement in the direction of, of, um, of you know, you know Interactions among community members and how does the school, uh, you know, play into that? Sort of one, one of the themes of that meeting in January. Um, the other thing is that, and so that's sort of a is a, an example of the sort of school community partnerships as depicted on the on the slide. But generally, the, you know, the school is a natural place for the, the, the citizens of the five towns um, to come together. But there's also a, um, a second, uh, more derivative and maybe less obvious um, opportunity that's presented by um, you know, sort of upgrading and you know, renovating and uh, you know, the high school. And, and that is that you know, we all hear stories about people who are interested in moving to, um, to our area. And, um, you know, and, and they, they, they come here and they take a look at the school, but they also might be looking you know, at Hinesburg, they might be looking at Middlebury, they might be looking at Virgins, and frankly, you know, as, as Don was suggesting in, in, in the previous slide, 
you know, people can make decisions about that and decide not to come here. So I think a, a derivative benefit of uh, improving uh, Mount Abe and, and bringing it back up to up to speed would be uh, increased uh, interest in people moving into into the community. This perhaps, or and I think has been has been seen in other other areas, uh, you know, both in Vermont and across the country. It you know, creates higher demand for um, you know for you know, you know for uh, you know for, pro you know, for property and therefore increases property values. Um, you know, again, houses can <coughs> and sell faster and at higher prices. And, and of course, um, you know, the, if with a larger grand list, you have, you know, the tax burden is shared by more taxpayers. So again, this is a sort of a, 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 has been an important component um, of the, you know, the, the, the renovation committee over the last few months. I mean, clearly we've been talking, you know, about, you know, specific, you know, renovations, you know, whether to have a new gym, whether to, whether to upgrade the auditorium, whether to, um, uh, you know, upgrade the library. But, you know, sort of underpinning a lot of both these discussions has been this interaction between the schools um, and the community, which um, were sort of, a, sort of a, a driving and very um, uh, in, important theme in the committee's uh, deliberations. So with that, I think we move to actual talk about the uh, proposed uh, renovations to this building. Okay, so my name is uh, Peter Zalonis. I just want to touch on something Brad said before we get into the actual renovations, because I've got four little kids. Um, so doing our part to try to reverse the population trend <laughs> here in town, personally. <laughs> and you know, when we moved here about seven years ago, um, the school was a big part of the decision, and we were very close to not moving here. We had put an offer on a house in Hinesburg because CVU, you know, much looks like a much better school than Mount Abe, and um, you know the sellers ended up backing out of the deal, and like Bristol Village seems like a great place to be, <laughs> and so here we are, and uh, you know even a couple of years ago, it's like, well, do we you know put this money into our house to try to renovate it, fix it up, or you know, we start looking north again because I, I commute all the way up to Shelburne, and it's like no, you know, we're we're rooted in this community. We love the community, and let's stay here and, and make it work. So here we are. And uh, coincidentally, I'm a structural engineer, so I like to get into the nuts and bolts of, of building. Uh, <coughs> professionally, I'm not involved in this project at all, but you know, I like building stuff. So um, I'm going to talk about big, some big picture items and also reference. Um, Kind of what changed between the November bond vote and this this bond vote? You know how that money got got cut out um, and what had to be given up. And an important thing to keep in mind is that right now this is all very conceptual. It's based on you know cartoon plans, and you know when the project actually moves into the design phase, that's when all the nuts and bolts get. You know that's when all the details get really figured out. You know, the construction documents will probably be about 200 pages of plans. You know, electrical, HVAC stuff, structural, architectural, design, you know, interior design stuff. And there'll probably be a project manual about that big that lists the specifications for everything. So right now, it's, you know, it's very conceptual. Things can be subject to change, but, you know, programmatically, as far as what's going to happen with the school, with the major renovations, uh, you yeah, know, everybody feels really good that, you know, we, it's, it's pretty dialed in. So, um, you know, one of the things you see here is, is in this front entrance. Yeah, so this is what's referred to as a curtain wall system, where you're taking out, you know, all that brick and all those fins and putting in, you know, these panelized systems and all this new glass. Now, one of the things that had to happen, so the architect, Doran Whittier, just to back up for a second, when um, we had to go back to them and you know, come up with, well, what can we do for $29.5 million instead of the $36 million? Um, you know, it, it, they presented that information um, kind of in a bullet form, and a memo form. You know, we didn't have the, the time to redo the plans. So I've marked up the plans. I'm going to kind of touch on some of this stuff here. But, like, some of these renderings and everything are based on, on the old things. Uh, so I'm going to kind of try to explain some of the things that have, have changed. So... You know, this is what's referred to as that, that curtain wall system, 
we're just letting in a bunch more light. Um, you know, that budget, that curtain wall budget had to be cut by about half. So, uh, you know, what you see in this picture might not be, not, might, not what, might not be what we get. And same thing, one of the things we're gonna, I'll talk about is the gym back in here. So this, uh, you know, block steel structure with these clear story windows, you know, that's, that's not really in the picture anymore either, because we had to cut a couple million dollars out of that gym budget. So, uh, you know, with redoing the gym, one of the things that they were able to, to do was eliminate that lot. There was a separate lobby back here. So the whole new, oops. So the whole new gym got shifted down. That separate entrance lobby got eliminated to reduce square footage. Square footage is construction costs. And then, um, you know, so the gym is being thought of as more of like a practice gym. Um, or, you know, kind of field house type structure. And so that, that allowed the elimination of the loop road going around. Uh, but is what is proposed for the site is to do the separate bus loop here, and then like a parent drop off loop here. So they're still separating the two lanes of traffic between the buses and the cars. Uh, so yeah, that was a big change for kind of the site plan stuff, eliminating the loop road, you know, was able to eliminate a lot of money out of the budget. Uh, so again, the gym you know, has shifted, this little lobby area uh, has been eliminated. And now is what's being proposed for the gym uh, is what's called uh, like a pre-engineered metal building or pre-engineered steel building. You know, pretty basic. Um, you know, if you think of something like, um, like Dollar General down in Virgins, you know, just a basic steel building. Um, you know, the bleachers, uh, you know, the size of the bleachers, the amount of bleachers have been reduced a little bit, but the overall size of the gym you know, will, will be the same. Uh, the terraces got eliminated, the cafeteria terraces. Uh, you know, so to talk about kind of what the, the main renovation things are, you know, so the, the lobby and front entrance will be getting, you know, that'll all, all be redone. Uh, you know, when you go online to, to get this presentation afterwards, you know, there's a bunch of notes on here. It says what, what everything is. There's a bunch of, you can't see it on here, but, uh, you know, there's all these green dashed lines everywhere. And that's, that's the curtain wall system. Again, that was all part of the original budget, but that's going to be reduced by about half. Uh, but, you know, still a new lobby, still a new lobby renovation. Um, you know, make that a lot more welcoming. Uh, you know, the library, media center, you know, all gets, all gets moved up to the front. Uh, one of the big items that, that got cut out is, uh, has to do with the auditorium. Uh, I think there's still money in there for new seating, but at one point there was this whole retractable wall and retractable uh, seating, so those got eliminated. The site, lamp, site uh, light and sound package, you know, that's eliminated from, from the budget right now. Uh, you know, the music, the music room renovations, which involves, because uh, right now it's a, it's a, tiered, a tiered system, so it's a, a really big uh, accessibility problem for students. So, you know, this is a pretty big chunk here to get it all leveled out, and the, the second floor uh, of this gets knocked out, so it's all, you know, more of like a clear story to be able to raise the whole platform up. Uh, you know, one of the other things that was eliminated uh, from the from the budget would be the um, finishes for the 2004 edition. So you know, carpet, and new paint, uh, that was part of the original budget. So that's that's no longer in there. But there's still re some reconfiguration of classrooms in here. Uh, new new elevator. Uh, you know that meets that meets code. Current one doesn't meet uh, accessibility code. Uh, so there's new elevator going in. Uh, one of the things you see, you know, if you take a close-up look at this plan, is there's a bunch of green lines in here, and that's referred to as borrowed lights. So to take to help with, um, you know, the in the indoor lighting. Uh, um, so some of that, you know, that budget got reduced by half. So we'll just have to be more choosy with where those borrowed lights go, you know, to kind of share 
uh, light from one space to the other. So for example, you know, here are some between the hallways and the pool. You know, are those gonna be there anymore? You know, I don't, I don't know. That's part of the design phase, but um, you know, it's part, part of the renovations. Uh, you know, the shops getting moved from upstairs to the downstairs, which was a pretty big deal to have uh, more accessible shop space um, for, the, for the building trade programs and shop, shop programs. Uh, let's see, what else? No, am I missing anything for the first floor? Library shifted to the front. Yep, library. To a left, because the wood shop is on the first floor currently in the front. And the metal shop is on the second floor above it. So in order to get all of Tech Ed in a in a space that would work for them, it made more sense that a program like that belongs at the back of the building to allow for the delivery of supplies and finished projects and stuff right now. Um, so to, and the library needed to be renovated anyway, so it made more sense to swap those two <coughs> in order to give Tech Ed the space it deserves. Um, and bring the library to the front. Thank you, Chris. Um, a new uh, you know, renovation of the existing lockers, which if anybody's been in there for open swim or anything knows they're pretty gross. Uh, you know, new lockers back here uh, to be directly accessible to the pool so you don't have to walk, walk through the hallways in your bathing suit and dripping towels. Yeah, I think that's the bulk of it for the first floor. Uh, second floor, you know, this is where everybody's favorite tandem classrooms are. Uh, so eliminating the tandem classrooms, you know, putting in, you know, new halls and new classrooms in there. Uh, you know, uh, you know, pretty extensive gut renovation of the science, of the science classrooms, science labs, the you know, wrestling space some work going on in um, you have some reconfiguration of classrooms more classroom space you know so as far as you know programmatically as far you know how the school is going to change those are kind of the I, I think I touched on all the all the all the big items um, you know, kind of a lot of the stuff you don't see I can go through you know what Engel, Engelberg was the you know was hired uh, I think by the architect as uh, uh, for pre-construction services to estimate a lot of the stuff based on these two plans. So, you know, they put out kind of by, it's called division, construction divisions, you know, what the different assumptions are, you know, for, for that budget. Um, so, you know, new countertops and cabinetry in the, cl in the classrooms, the science classrooms, uh, you know, new wood surround in the auditorium for the proscenium, uh, you know, spruce that up. Uh, update that. Uh, new uh, replace replace a lot of the glazing, a lot of the windows. You know, um, I think there are ten it says here. There's ten locations that have you know the window seals have failed, the windows have failed. So replacing existing windows. Uh, obviously, anything that gets touched, you know, have new new finishes applied. Uh, you know, one of the things to consider is in the uh, in that gym space is. You know that'd be one of the first thing that, that goes up, so it can be used as swing space uh, for classrooms, temporary classrooms. You know while the rest of the renovation is going on, because all this work can't be done during one summer. So you're going to be able to shuffle classrooms and people around while the renovation work is going on. So by you know creating that that new gym space and making that temporary classrooms, uh, you know that goes that goes a long way to having to rent. I think. And it was one or two million dollars, something like that. That was estimated that you would need to rent temporary trailers. Um, but you know, so the new gym building goes up, and you know, you need carpeting in there, you need partitions, you know, ceilings, uh, projectors, you know, electrical work. So you know, all all that stuff is part of the construction costs. Uh, You know, obviously, you know, new toilets and sinks and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of new lockers for the locker rooms. Projectors, you know, so updating technology. It's so getting new projectors in all the new classrooms. Uh, and for the temporary classrooms, 
you know, the, the science, science labs get a lot of work as far as, you know, new plumbing and gas lines and countertops and sinks and, you know, all the stuff that's needed to run a modern science lab. Uh, you know, casework, so cabinets and, um, you know, woodworking. Uh, you know, new seats for the auditorium, replace the existing seats. New elevator, uh, fire fire suppression. So the whole whole building gets sprinklered. Um, you know, so you need new pumps, you need new storage tanks for that. And then, uh, yeah, I mean the other stuff is a little bit more infrastructure type things, but you know the plumbing, you know a lot of uh, HVAC work, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. You know, there's a lot of work in here, and it's included to improve the air quality, CO2 monitoring. Um, you know, dampers, uh, you know, electrical upgrades, distribution panels, you know, light fixtures and LED light fixtures, uh, let's see, communications, you know, so bringing all, the, all that infrastructure up to date, you know, all the, all the data cables and, and then uh, security. So new fire alarm system, security cameras, you know, motion detectors, and uh, yeah, and then you know, earthwork, landscaping, and exterior improvements. One of the other big things to note that got uh, eliminated from this new bond budget would be the um, uh, you know, all the exterior, like outbuildings and field improvements and track improvements. So none of that that stuff's included anymore. So that's, I think, the uh, kind of general overview of, of what's included. You know, obviously there's a lot more specifics that we can get into, but um, happy to take questions when we're done. Is it worth talking a little bit about, you mentioned security, that the new entrance is around that slide? I don't know many details about that. So as Don mentioned before, right now you go to the single door to the left um, during the school day and no one can really see you there except for a little camera that's sort of okay to sort of see people. Um, and then we're trusting that once you're in and have full reign of the school, you're gonna come in and state your business and, and let people know why you're there. This design has, um, you can sort of see it in this picture, where you would first be allowed into sort of this vestibule where you're making more personal contact with someone um, and stating your business before you're granted access to the entire building. So it, it adds a layer of security in terms of granting access uh, to visitors. Next. I'm Allison Servant. I'm principal, <coughs> and uh, I have three kids in the Bristol school system. Two here at Mount Abe, one in the high school, one in the middle school, and then a second grader at BES. Um, these are just more pictures, uh, renderings from the November 2017 bond, uh, just to give you an idea of your thoughts. So I'm going to talk about the cost. Um, the goal of this project is, and the vision, is to renovate our school um, so that the students and the staff have a 21st century learning environment um, so that we can educate our kids, improve outcomes for our kids, and as well as celebrate our community, um, expand opportunities for people in our community, um, say thank you to the community for its faith in us and celebrate all of the wonderful things that we do here in the building. Um, educationally, we talked about plays, musicals, uh, concerts, the Pops concert, uh, sporting events inside and outside, and just being able to say we take a lot of pride in, the, in our building. So, the project cost and bond is 2018, we're voting on Tuesday, March 6th, is $29 million. <coughs> so what changed from November 2017 to now? 
So we had our original work. The original vote in um, November 2014, uh, the first voted down bond was 32 million at a property tax per 100,000 assessed value at 153.39. The um, most recent vote, the cost of the project was $36,664,349, but the bond that we put forward was 35 million because we had already built into the school budget 1.6 million, either in, 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 in anticipation of a bond passing or if a bond not passing, we needed to do work. The board um, is fully committed to doing it one way or the other. So we needed to put the money in when we made that commitment. That bond failed. So now um, we, the renovation committee came back and talked about it and um, through uh, talk, discussed uh, some numbers and gave a couple options to Dorr and Whittier. One option was 25 million, just a straight cost. Um, and they said you would start losing program uh, functionality if you did that. Uh, 29,500,000, we could do all of the um, priorities that the community, the staff, the students have mentioned over and over and over again as we've done these um, surveys and looking into what we want to do, we didn't want to start hacking programs off. We wanted to maintain the integrity of what everyone was telling us they wanted at a cost that um, taxpayers could support. So we cut from the project cost itself, um, $5.1 million, give or take, um, and then uh, because project costs were cut, you're able to um, reduce the amount that uh, the soft costs, that um, are the fees and all those kinds of things, you're able to uh, reduce that as well. So the total um, reduction uh, in cost from 36 million to 29 and a half is uh, almost 20 percent. And then the reduction in the bond cost is almost 16 percent. And um, the November bond 2017, it was 87.10 per 100,000. And this go around, it's $68.40 per 100,000 of that assessed value, which is a drop of 1870, which is even more than the drop from here. It's almost um, completely, this 2018 bond is almost half of the 2014 in terms of cost to uh, the property tax. Um, Pete talked about it a little bit about what changed, what got cut. So the bond from November was 35 million. The actual project cost was 36 million six hundred sixty four thousand three hundred forty nine dollars. So we um, reduced the gym cost by two million dollars. We um, reduced the theater and auditorium improvements, new lighting, sound systems, uh, the retractable wall and back retractable seating took off about a million, reduced uh, various upgrades throughout the building, um, the fit and finish on the middle school wing, um, it, various things, uh, about 830,000. Reduce the aesthetic upgrades to the front of the building, so it's that curtain wall that Peter was talking about. Um, that was that's half. We uh, we took out six hundred thousand dollars there. Um, eliminated the outside exterior site improvements. Um, eliminated the not new bus loop around the back and just doing a reconfiguration of the current access. We were able to eliminate money there. So the total project scope reductions five point two million dollars. Then because that reduced the entire project. The contractor costs reduced by almost two million, so we're able to get to a bond and a project cost of twenty-nine million five hundred thousand. So the total project cost is twenty-nine five. Their projected tax impact is sixty-eight dollars forty cents per 
100,000 of assessed property value. Since we've gone down from 35 to 29 and a half, this is now a 55% reduction in projected tax impact from the 2014 bond, which was 153.39 per 100,000. That is because of now, with the reduction in the price, 50% of the projected bond payment is already contained in our school district budget. And um, renovating now will reduce emergency repair costs, such as last year's gym floor. That was a huge eye-opener in terms of we know it's there, and it's starting to rear its ugly head. Um, so what does this all mean? Uh, in today's dollars, the 2014 bond would, would be almost $38 million, if not more, and that's just based on construction cost escalation of 4 to 5% per year. So if this bond doesn't pass, each year we're going to continue construction cost escalation to the amount of 4 to 5% each year, and interest rates, where it's a 30-year bond, interest rates are rising. Uh, when we voted in November 2017, the federal fund rate, which drives every interest rate after that, was uh, half a percent. Now it's one and a half percent. So in just the space from November to now, it's gone up <coughs> one and a full percent. And um, all the respected economists and business people expect a quarter percent increase each quarter for this year. So if the bond passes, we're able to do our um, financing uh, now as opposed to waiting another year. So at this rate, if we have to endure all of these things, each month that passes, if it doesn't pass on Tuesday, the cost increases more than 120,000 per month when you take all of these things into account because if the bond does pass, um, we would have an 11 month design phase. It's just the way this is set up. Um, like Pete said, it's a concept. The foundation and the basic premise for the programming is all in that concept, but we haven't gotten to doorknobs and fit and finish and how many uh, borrowed lights are going to get built in. That will take place during the 11 month design phase once a bond gets started, uh, passed. If it passes, construction would start summer 2019. If it doesn't pass on March 6th, construction could start no earlier than the summer of 2020. That means with the cost escalation, construction cost escalation, and <coughs> increase in interest rates that is guaranteed. Um, project costs could increase by at least one and a half million. And then on top of that, the total interest paid uh, could increase more than two million. So you go from um, 23 million for the construction, the actual things that will happen in the building, um, if it passes now, you go from that to adding on a good four million more to the cost of the project, which means we will have $4 million less that we can spend on actual improvements to the building. So instead of 23 million, we'd be able to spend 19. And uh, if we were gonna start hacking at programs at 25 million, uh, 19 million is not pretty. I, I can't even imagine what that, that would get us um, the changes to code and safety, and that's it. Um, health and safety and code, and accessibility. So, with that being said, um, this Tuesday with the bond vote, renovating Mount Abe will never be more afford affordable than it is now. Um, when we voted in 2014, at that point the um, suggestion was what it was, and at that point that's how much it cost. Now it's escalated uh, to over 38 million, so if we don't get this to pass now, it'll be even more expensive, and we'll get a lot less for the money. And with that, we'll go to Q&A. Questions and answers. Yes, sir. The uh, rent cost breakdown estimates that you have online somewhere? I don't think we've put that up yet. 
I don't think the full details. Yeah, I think we just got that. <coughs> Will that be yet before Tuesday? Um. <coughs> we can get it up. Yep, we can get it up. It'll be on the the, uh, the district website. The district website. Yep. Um, in your renovation, how did you factor in uncertainty with um, either rising school populations or declining populations? Um, do you have a sense of that? I mean, from what I read on Front Porch Bar and, and Addie Indy, that, that seems to be kind of an unknown. Or is that just, um, can you address that? Um, in the current uh, district report, there's a, a table that shows all the students enrolled in the district from kindergarten through now. I believe it's our ninth grade class. Yes, it's, the smallest. it's the smallest. It's 74 students that are already in Mount Abe. Um, it's the current kindergarten and first grade classes that are at, uh, 97 and 98 students between then and there, if you look at 12th to 11th to 10th to 9th, with, with those exceptions, they all stay within the same range. So for decades beyond, I mean, this is a, you know, this renovation, you know, is for the decades to come. So what I'm wondering is if there was any, like, population or you know, area population projections or studies done, or studies done to project what um, school populations would be like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road based on, you know, many different uh, factors. And, and I would say to that, we have the capacity to accommodate an increase in our student population. Um, it has been going from the time the first class entered in the fall of 1968, it's across the state, um, student population has been going down. So we do have the capacity to accommodate any increase beyond what we're even projecting for kindergarten and um, first grade. So there's no, cons we won't have to add. I think that might be what you're asking. Well, add what or shrink. I mean, you know Well, and we're not, we, we're anticipating pretty much a leveling off with some dip, dips and dips, but it's it's projected to level off We've, um, for quite a few years out. I think there's a, a number of variables really that go into how many students will be educated in this building. Um, right now we're thinking of it as a 712 building because that's what it is and that's what it's been for a long time. It's hard to know. 10 years from now, will it still be a 712 building? If there's some crazy population boom, maybe it's a 912 building. If population continues to decline and we don't operate all of our schools the way we do now, which there's lots of conversation around the state, maybe it's a 512 building, maybe it's a 612 building. And so the number of students that are educated here um, is somewhat tied to the number of students we have overall and somewhat tied to the grade levels we choose to serve within the, the walls of this building. So it's there's a number of variables that would lead to how many students are going to be here in the future. And I think another consideration also is that the, the, the concept doesn't include any increase in the number of classrooms. The number of classrooms stays the same. So it's not like the, the, this project is, is, is designed to accommodate a, um, you know, a larger student population that we really don't know, that, that we, we, might, we just don't know about. So the number of classrooms stays the same. And with the exception of the science classrooms and the art rooms <coughs> and obviously the gym and the, the cafeterias that are specialized spaces, all the other classrooms will be flexible and can be used for any subject that they need to be. If, if it needs to be an English classroom in the morning but we have more something else in the afternoon, they'll have that flexibility to make it a social studies room or, or whatever. I have two questions. One is, did you say how uh, that moisture problem from the pool is being addressed? Are you going to fix that? Ventilation. So yeah, proper ventilation, ventilation for the pool. So what about the outside brickwork? Is that going to be all done over or changed somehow? Or does it not need to be? Correct? Around just the pool or the entire building? You know, the photograph uh, that you right, have of all that, that damage to that brickwork? Yeah. The, um, 
our, our concept hasn't gotten this far. I don't think they gave us a design for the back of the building. That would come out in the design phase where windows may be added there that would take away that brick facade. There's a, there's a lot of brick with, with not even inside and out. So that, that would, that's a detail that would be ironed out in the design phase. But the new ventilation system should take is, care of it. Is here. Yes. yes. So my second question is about the embankment. I've um, looked into this a little bit, and I know there's money in the budget to address the stability of the embankment at the back of the school, but that says to me, if there's money to address the embankment, that maybe that embankment isn't stable. So could you describe what's been researched about that embankment? So, the and Patrick can stop me if I'm wrong, but the embankment, um, is stable. It, it's been studied repeatedly since the um, middle school addition was added. There's been some natural stabilization that's occurred um, with trees, planting, and all that. There's no, um, for lack of the right term, excavating happening on our side. Um, the other thing that has to do with that is that Mount Abe does not own that property. So it would, it would have to be worked out whether the district does the work to stabilize the building and then goes after the owners to recoup that cost or work something out. So. The only thing I would add to that is, uh, as I understand it, when that was an active gravel pit, that created some problems um, for us. It's no longer active on this end, so the activity for the excavation from the gravel pits further to the north now, so it's not impacting that bank anymore. And we have had, I think, three or four uh, different studies done by engineering firms over the past few years. So when they put the wood chip boiler on the back end of the building, they had to do a study. Um, and there's been, and maybe when they made the, did the south end addition, so there's been a few studies over the last several years. Um, and they do indicate there's some work that should happen. And that's what led to putting some money in for the, and the, there's a line in there, it's escarpment stabilization. Um, 375,000-ish, I think, is the number that comes to mind that's earmarked for stabilizing that so that even though it's not active anymore, we're not going to see from erosion and other weather events any, any more um, so, so land. So you can do that work even though the school doesn't own the land? To protect our investment, yeah. Thank you. Elon Melk here at Bristol. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm real sad for some of the things that we lost from the last bond vote, and I'm curious if things change and we're in a different place in 10 years, what are the things that we talked about there can still be done? Like, we're not going to be adding more windows once you've decided how many windows are going to be. Obviously, the patios would be really easy to add, but they're not what I care about as much as some of the other things. Could someone speak to what of the things we lost will still be possible in 10 years? Is that just? So uh, um, just easy stuff. Uh, some of the work in the auditorium can certainly be fundraised for and, and done at any time. Because what, what we're trying to do with this bond is uh, you may see that this wall right here, but once you dig into that, it's connected to other things. So you don't, we don't want to do one thing and then a couple years down the road try to do something else. We've got to tear out what we already did. So the goal with this um, revised bond was to do all the stuff that's connected so that we do it once and then separate out the auditorium that could be fundraised for the the curtain and and all that so or added as the budget allows and I might add to that really there isn't anything that we've lost that couldn't be done in 10 years it's just a matter of how much work is it going to take and how much money is it going to take to do it um, and when I think about so I think about the Virgins project 15 years ago and they made a pretty significant investment in their facility and in talking with folks involved in that process um, you know, they trimmed a million and a half, a couple million dollars, something like that, to get it to pass. And and now looking to try and do some of those things 15 years later, what was $2 million is now $8 million or $9 million. Uh, and so to me, that's where it gets to be more complicated. And that's, I think, there's some hindsight on the folks that were involved in that. Well, if only we had done it for $2 million 15 years ago, that would have been a much better investment than $8 million now. 
So I think that's sort of the, the cost that comes to mind for me when we're thinking 10 plus years down the road trying to do some of these things that we're not doing now. And they have a bond in, in March too, I believe. They're putting one up to do what they did when they had to cut the first time around. So it's going to cost them even more money to do it now. Oh, um, you guys want to rock, know. paper, scissors? Or? <laughs> I think I know the answer to this, but um, I wasn't clear from the way, um, the way Peter was describing it. Is, um, is the music room raising still? Yeah. Okay. That's an accessibility right. issue. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any consideration to solar energy or solar power? Patrick. Wait, uh, sure. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, so that conversation has come up. Um, so that costs money. So that would add to the cost. And that isn't something that's been included yet in any of the projects. So sort of the, the attempts have been trying to scale back the scope of work. So we haven't, in the process of trying to scale back, been adding the concept of solar. Really, the focus has been more on right now, let's make the building much more energy efficient before we start thinking about alternative ways to produce the energy. Uh, not to say that that couldn't be something in the future, but right now it's about reduced energy usage. Um, isn't it a loss of, you know, the amount of money less you pay for, for energy uh, from the uh, solar energy? So some of our schools do use solar, and we're not finding it to really save lots of money. Um, you know, certainly it's a, it's a great thing in terms of carbon footprint, uh, but from an economic standpoint, uh, it's pretty close to a wash has been our experience um, with the much smaller scale uh, operations we have going right now in a couple of different schools. In part because we don't get any tax benefits as a school. So a lot of the, the homeowner solar with 30% um, tax breaks, we don't experience. So. Um, for us to purchase solar ourselves and put them on, it's 30% more than if a homeowner did it. So right away you start not having the same economic benefit. And so we work with folks that are looking to sort of off-put their power from solar um, arrays that they have elsewhere. People approach us half a dozen times a year saying, hey, do you want to be an off-taker of some of the solar power that we're producing? And as we investigate, it's a good thing environmentally and we want to support that, but in some, in some cases, it actually costs us more money than what we're paying now. So for us right now, focusing on reduced energy usage um, actually seems like probably the better long run uh, idea um, for carbon footprint purposes. And we can explore alternative energies down the road still. Anne? Um, one of the problems that I'm having just with, with looking at the numbers that you folks have put up tonight and, and sort of in the whole conversation that's happened around the changes in the bond over the years, and I, is just that nobody has mentioned that we've moved from a 20-year bond to a 30-year bond, right? And that's a huge amount of interest. So you're now asking taxpayers, yes, it looks like it's going to be less per 100,000 um, per year, Right? So, so that movement looks great, but what's lacking is that we're going to be paying for it for an extra 10 years, and the interest cost is just, is just staggering. So, so I'm just, I'm not, there's a bit there where, where it feels like you're kind of presenting information to us, but it's not the full story, and that, that is a concern of mine, because again, I, I want to retire here. Right, and and paying for something, you know, over thirty years is is a long time. I don't know. I I you know it's not that um, we're trying to be non-transparent. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're giving you the numbers that we have, and there is a reason that the administration decided to go with a 30-year bond as opposed to a 20-year bond. And we talked about that the last time we had a meeting. Um, and I don't, Patrick, I don't know if you remember, but would you mind addressing that? I think no, you know, so the... So there's, there's a logical reason as to why we're doing it. 
and we're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes by not mentioning it's ooh, it, it was 20 but don't say anything now it's 30. <laughs> we're not doing that there's a logical reason as to why we picked that so I, i'll let patrick I, I address that Maybe it came across a bit, maybe the delivery wasn't great from my side, but it's just when you just look strictly at those at that chart and you try and compare and you look at you and, and you go, well, that's, that's great, it makes sense, but there's hidden costs there. And right, and Patrick can answer that question. So, the, so I made the recommendation to the board to go with a 30-year bond uh, because 10 or 15 years ago, it was pretty commonplace for school construction like this that the state would pay for 20% of the cost. It still comes from taxpayer dollars, of course, but locally the impact was mitigated by a 20% reduction in cost to, to local taxpayers. So it was pretty commonplace for there to be 20-year bonds for construction projects like this because you had 20% kind of knocked off the top. Uh, that's gone now. Uh, so we, we pay the full cost of this construction um, on top of that, construction costs are much higher now than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So to do a project of this scale in a 20-year note absolutely saves interest, um, but has a significantly higher tax impact now. Um, and what we've been hearing loud and clear from folks is um, a big reason why the bond has not passed yet is because people can't afford the tax impact. And so as we're looking to mitigate tax impact both by reducing the scope of the project um, while trying to get all the priorities that have remained consistent for four or five years done. Um, and one way to do that is reducing the scope of the work. Another way to do that is to, to stretch out the length of the term. And so it was those factors really led to me recommending to the board that we go with the 30 year to make it as affordable as we can now because that's what we're hearing is why this isn't passing. Nobody really disagrees that the building needs work. That, that hasn't been the case as to why this is not passing. Um, not that there aren't some people maybe that feel that way, but by and large, that's not why it's getting no. Um, it's because it's, it costs too much. And so we're trying to find ways to take care of that. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Douglas Dave from Starksboro. Could you talk a little bit about security? Um, I understand what you mean by the front door and one person at a time so far. But how do you view security and work, any items cut that you feel were, are necessary to keep our kids safe? I don't think there are any items that were cut out of the, the $36.6 million total project costs that reduce security measures at the school. Um, that was one of the priorities mm -hmm. yeah. that everyone identified. And you feel comfortable with what is currently going to be put in place? I feel great about the addition of the new entryway and having that second stage entrance. Right. That I think makes a big difference. Uh, I do think, you know, and some of there's, I think there's a lot more that could be discussed as we get into the design phase that wouldn't be appropriate at the concept phase that we're in now. For example, they make a safety film that you can put over glass that, you know, it's transparent, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't decrease the natural light or any of that stuff, but it makes it so you can't break in a window very easily and get into the building that way if someone were inclined to do that. So as we're looking to add glass to the front, I think that's something we need to consider. Uh, so there are some things like that, that through the design phase, we can continue to look for ways to enhance the security. Um, and it's always finding that balance between increasing security, but having it feel like a welcoming place for students and adults, um, both folks that work here and folks from the community to visit. So. Uh, we'll continue to, to walk that line and, and make decisions that keep people safe. And a lot of the safety has to do with the procedures that are in place in the school, and, and we practice drills, and, and those wouldn't change as a result of any of this. But um, I think that, that sort of notion of um, making the building more difficult to get into for someone that's looking to do harm is still intact in this new model, this new version. Um, suppose the bond passed and you had your design phase, and then um, maybe this just would never happen, but I know it happened in Lincoln. But um, and it came in under budget when everything was paid off, saying there was a million dollars left over. Does that million immediately go back to pay up down the bond, or is that just then used on other? Yeah, so as I understand it, um, once we secure a bond, so if we get a bond for $29.5 million, that is the amount of money we get. And we have to spend it 
on this building because that's what the bond is secured for. We couldn't use the bond to pay for other buildings and, and we can't use the bond to pay for the bond, unfortunately, and we looked into that too, I think. Um, so, so we're committing to an amount of money to invest in the school. Um, there are plenty of things that aren't on the list. So if it came in a million dollars under budget, we'd celebrate. We'd think about, so what did we knock off that we can now bring back in? Um, and, and unfortunately, a million dollars doesn't get you very far um, for some of those things. Well, and then the converse. What happens, um, and this is the thing I never understand in construction, because I've never built a house or anything, but um, is this like a fixed bid, or what if it gets towards the end, and it's like, oh, well, the price of this and this and this went up, so it's going over. You know, we need another million and a half to pay off, you know. The so that doesn't happen. So the, the, we need another million and a half. Like We have what we have in the budget, and that might help get us somewhere where there's some sort of room for negotiation there. Um, but it's not a matter of, oh, well, we need to make the bond bigger now. That, that doesn't happen. We say, we can't do some of the things we thought we could do as we're getting the bids. Like You have to make those adjustments so that the 29.5 is the 29.5. That's what we have to work with. But I mean, it's a more of a kind of like a fixed bid where the contractor says yes I will deliver this 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 and this and for and the maximum price will be this so I, I think it's I mean this will be the first time I've engaged in a project this size um, because it's a really big project there are far too many things to like it couldn't be that we're gonna we're gonna start tearing into walls and we have no idea what we're gonna find behind there so there's no way somebody could and I don't think we would want that to happen because if we're saying what you give us is what it has to be you can't be anything different it's going to be high right out of the gate <laughs> because they're going to have to protect themselves as contractors um, to make sure that they're covered from what we find in the walls. Um, so there, there tend to be a series of change orders along the way as we learn more and we have to make those adjustments and change orders always cost money. Um, but that's I think the nature of a project this size. It's a 170,000 square foot building. Uh, so that's, and that's and so, 70 homes that we're doing all at the same time. And we, we could find lots of different things and we'll have to adjust as we learn more. So this is probably another dumb question, but um, so these guys, like they've done this before, I mean on large scale and you have, they've done other schools or other commercial buildings and they have a track record and there's people that you can do diligence on. They say, yeah, you know, they do, but you know, delivered a lot of value and bang for the buck and stuff. Yeah, so there, there are probably folks in the room that could speak to it better than I can, but when we put the bids out, um, contractors are vetted. Uh, they have to meet certain requirements. They have to have certain insurances. So this, like, John Doe, a, a contractor from wherever, isn't necessarily qualified to take on a project this size. It will be probably larger construction outfits that have that have the experience. We're going to be looking uh, for companies that have worked probably specifically in schools before that have done projects this size. Um, and that have that credibility and we do the reference checks and it'll have to be put out to bid. We'll get multiple offers from multiple companies. Uh, it's a fairly extensive process. We then have, uh, we would pay for a clerk of the work so we have somebody who's familiar with the construction industry, em employed by us working on our behalf, making sure that things are happening in our best interests. Um, it's pretty extensive oversight of the project on many, many scales. And I don't allow any others who do this work for a living to speak to that. Do you I have any, with his hand up in the back. I just wanted to add one more thing that um, in you'll notice in the project breakdown that there's a large amount of money set aside for as a contingency fund so that we do give ourselves a cushion that if we do open a wall and discover something that was unexpected mm -hmm. that that is reserved and that kind of allows us to cushion and make sure that we hit that target and get really the priorities met. And that's probably where any, any coming in under budget would happen because we have to assume that we're going to find some things that are unpleasant and cost more than we thought. If we're pleasantly surprised, then those soft costs, that was embedded in the soft costs in the presentation, then that's where we we're, are most likely probably to free up some money. Steve? That freed up money just goes, that freed up money doesn't, doesn't go to paying anything down or all of a sudden you don't go, oh, we don't need $5 million, we're going to shorten the term of the bond or anything like that. You have to spend that extra. As I understand it now, yeah, so okay. if we take out a $29.5 million bond for 30 years, that's what we're committing to. Okay. Steve, did you have anything you wanted to? Well, the contingency thing was the main thing. Okay. Um, the second thing is that um, the process is going to be that the, the 
design firm is going to do uh, a, a new set of, uh, a more detailed set of drawings after the bond is, is voted in, and then they'll be getting another estimate, um, and that estimate will be based on better information that may happen more than once. And at the beginning of this process, there's a contingency not only on the owner's side for unforeseen things, but there's a contingency <coughs> on um, the estimate for the designer and the, and the contractor because they don't have great drawings yet. As soon as the drawings and the design gets more detailed, they're able to reduce their contingency um, because they understand the project better. And then once it goes out to bid, you get hard numbers in, and you can see if you can reduce that contingency on the contractor side even more. Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of a discovery phase that happens after the bond vote um, uh, passes to, um, as Patrick said, sort of reduce the risk on everybody's side before the project really gets a shovel on the ground. And I would just add to that that I think there are some folks in our community that would like to have that level of information now. The trick is, it's a few hundred thousand dollars probably to get that level of information, all those drawings and all those details, and it's the months it will take to do that design, and to go through that process not knowing if it's going to pass, and then if it doesn't and we make adjustments and that has to be redone, didn't seem like a great use of taxpayer dollars. So that's sort of why we have information at the level we have right now and not more information that some folks have wanted. I would add to that that there are some interesting opportunities as you look at fit and finish, because talking about what, what gets changed at the end, you know, it's when you fix up a house, you don't get the, the premium stove if you've you know, had to do a bunch of new plumbing. Fit and finish, but also technology. So that's where I do a lot of that EDM. And the, and the opportunities there, by not committing to a technology budget right up front, it'll be as part of the bid, obviously. That's a moving target. Technology is constantly changing. There's some fantastic opportunities where you could actually bring the technology up higher to what the students really you know, need, and some great opportunities for teaching and learning, and some great opportunities to embed technology into the project. If there's op if that's where we find a lot of opportunities at UVM buildings. So there's some exciting things that could happen if the walls, when they open the walls, they aren't as bad as everyone thinks they are. Yes, sir. Do I understand right the original population of the school was about a thousand back in '69? That is true. Was it um, I hear that um, it was mighty tight in this building when there were about a thousand students in it. And so um, right now we do have some classes that are at capacity. A lot of our classrooms are actually um, were undersized by about a hundred square feet. Um, and so we, you know, tend to have classes that range maybe you know 15 to 22. Um, and we've got packed classrooms right now. My question is in regards to the gym. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what has changed that now 700 students can't use one gym when 1,000 students could play use one gym? I'm going to let Dustin answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, for athletics, there's, there's a lot more teams now. And there why why is there more teams? And to them, there wasn't girls teams, there wasn't a middle school program, and now there's over 40 teams at, at, at Mount A. I'm not the athletic director, Devin is busy with basketball. Sorry. Dustin, just make sure you're loud enough so everybody can oh, yeah. hear you out there. So yeah, I mean now, you know, the extracurricular opportunities and the programs that we offer at Mount A have grown a lot. I mean, far different, I wasn't around in 1969, so. But I do know that there's a lot more now. There's middle school programs, you know, but in 69 there wasn't girls programs and then the sport, I coached the varsity girls soccer team here. I think the program began as a club program in like 1982. And I can't remember the exact year off the top of my head they started playing uh, as a VPA sponsor in the VPA tournament. But you know, as programs began, they began with one varsity team that was probably four grade levels together and no middle school program, and now there's a varsity team and a JV team and an eighth grade team and a seventh grade team, um, whereas in 1969, there wasn't any team at all for soccer, so, and, you know, just extrapolate that out to, a, you know, all the sports programs that 
are offered now. Uh, there's, and there's great learning opportunities for kids, you know, in sports and extracurriculars after school. And th those programs have really, really grown. And just in during the school day, I mean, I don't know much about what the physical education program looked like in 1969, but I mean, today, now, um, you know, every block of the day we have between two and three, uh, we even have one class block where there's four PD classes happening simultaneously. Uh, we actually have a couple classes that meet at Bristol Fitness and use their space, which helps us with, with the space issue, but, um, you know, things have evolved. I know when I was a middle school student here in the 90s, uh, class blocks were shorter. We had like seven blocks a day. So classes were much shorter. I mean, I don't think the, in phys ed, the classes were as good a quality as they are now. Now, now the blocks are longer. Um, so you don't have as many blocks. So as far as delivering instruction to the same number of kids, if you have half as many blocks, you're only going to reach half as many students, but they're in the duration of their class block is longer uh, and better. Um, but uh, I mean, for us, I can speak to what the situation is currently. You know, um, every block of the day, there's at least two, um, often three. One block where we have four classes happening simultaneously. And you know, if you go look at the gym now where the basketball game is going on, you know, the gym looks pretty large because. The vinyl curtain isn't shut, but when you're having multiple classes happening simultaneously, you know, what it really looks like is the vinyl curtain's pulled. You have one class of 22 with a teacher on one side of the vinyl curtain, another class of 22 on the other side of the vinyl curtain, and another class of 22 swimming in the pool. And, you know, there's a lot of noise and interference, and um, you don't have a lot of space to move, which impacts how much you're going to. Uh, be able to exercise and get your heart rate up if you don't, you know, almost any activity you do, if you have a little more space, you can move more, you can get your heart rate up more. You know, I was just doing pickleball today. On half the gym, we can fit three pickleball courts, which if you're playing doubles, that gets, you know, 12 kids on the courts playing, so you have about half on the courts and half off, whereas you have that same class of 22, if you have a full gym, you'd have six courts, everybody's playing at the same time. So to have the extra space would certainly enrich the programs and help us meet our goals in phys ed a lot better, be a much better, more enriching experience for the students, a lot more flexibility uh, with, with the scheduling. Uh, you know, the phys ed staff is shared, the space is shared, Midland High School, um, so it, it is a really tricky puzzle to try to figure out how, you know, to deliver instruction to kids and meet, you know, by, by education quality standards, you know, now in Vermont, you know, kids K through eight need to have phys ed twice weekly um, throughout the year, you know, and, and in high school they need uh, one and a half years of PE. So, you know, at the moment we, what we offer pretty much meets the minimum of that. Uh, and we're struggling in the amount of space we have, trying to, in our schedule, <coughs> in the space we have, and the staff we have, to find ways to deliver instruction to students and have it, um, you know, a, an environment and enough space <coughs> to do quality PE uh, is a challenge with just the one gym. And I would add a, from the co-curricular perspective, so I have a daughter in the middle school here, and she's on the, she plays basketball, uh, and the experience that she had as a seventh grader and an eighth grader, and I think it's true on the boys' side too, probably more than half, maybe as much as three quarters of their practice time as basketball players in the middle school program doesn't happen in the gym. It's in the hallways and it's in the classrooms, and that's where practice happens. There were weeks where she had 30 minutes of gym time on half the gym, and that was their entire gym time as a basketball team at the middle school level um, because it's just booked solid. Um, and that's with teams at Bristol Elementary School and with teams starting at 6 in the morning and teams going until 9 or 9.30 at night. Uh, so despite all those efforts to alleviate the pressures on the gym schedule for the practices, it's still 30 minutes at times in a whole week. Has anyone, no one suggests the situation of, has someone put some kind of its cost fee into the system <coughs> to, I'm sorry, can you keep it up? Has someone thought about, are we, are we allowing too much, 
uh, activity going on. I mean, I, it's, if, you keep, if you keep believing the athletic programs, eventually it will always expand to fill whatever space you have. And the question is, has it really, I mean, do we really need all of 40 teams to be, <coughs> be in, in this space? So Devin could actually talk to how it's not just sports teams, the gym, <coughs> drives the master schedule during the day for all of the other academic stuff that happens. All of the other courses can't be placed until the gym and the um, programming that happens in there during the school day gets decided and then all of the other academic programs get placed in terms of timing and schedule. Um, so it's not just co-curricular basketball teams, baseball teams not being able to get out in, in the spring because it's mud season. It's, it's a lot more of the academic programming. Um, you know, so yeah, it sucks to have a practice at 6 o'clock. 1969 to now, then the academic programming within the education <laughs> system has expanded. Is it the requirements of the state that have There are state mandates, that? there are federal mandates, and there is a set amount of time during the day that classes have certain lengths, and um, but Devin can speak to how one room. <laughs> oh, you I'm right. Dustin. I'm sorry, Dustin. Dustin. Oh, no. oh my gosh, Devin, Kevin, and Dustin. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, Dustin. As to how one room. That's what struck me is the the gym is really what drives the master schedule for our academics in this building, and another gym. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy like that, but another gym, another space where we can um, yeah, relieve like, the like pressure. Like the gym and the cafeteria is another one. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to, you know, put together a schedule, Jess could speak to this as well. You know, the, those are constraints because you, you're sharing it. You've got, you know, for the cafeteria, you're trying to figure out when can you put two middle school lunch blocks, when you, can you put two high school lunch blocks. And then you've got to sort of work the schedule around from that. And the same, you know, for when PE is happening, you, you have to, you know, while the kids are in court on their core area for instruction, you know, they, you can't deliver PE to them at that time. So you have to create a schedule where there's enough PE space and staff for them when, when they are off team, you know, the one or two blocks in their schedule where they're off team, that's when they have to come to the gym then you also have to then the ninth grade teams and then the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders get it all to work so that you're maximizing the use of the space in the gym. Because of well, in the process here, you're just placing four classrooms, right? There's four mobile trailers out there right now. No. Mm -hmm. gonna, no. There are no mobile classrooms no out mobile, there. No They're all gone. They've been gone. Okay. Elin? As a parent of two teens who sometimes play sports and sometimes don't, there is such an incredible difference in my children when they do extracurricular activities. It means so much. It would be, it needs to be expanded. It can't possibly be cut. It's, it seems like it's the hardest time ever to be a teen. I'm sure it's always been hard to be a teen. But the sports programs, the theater programs, the music programs are so to when my kids aren't doing those, they're not finishing their homework. It doesn't make any sense. They have more time, but the, the sports programs are so important, as, as, as are all the programs. Yes, sir. Uh, and I agree, and to, to speak about athletics, athletic programs, and academic programs, I. I tend to think that that's the wrong way to, that's the traditional way to look at it. Education includes all of those things. Well, I'm not that, no, no, it, it, let me finish. That you engage students where their interests are. And if their interests are in the arts, if their interests are in the sports, if their interests are in science, they get engaged there. And it carries over to everything else. And Athletics, arts, the humanities, 
STEM are all on equal footing in terms of educational outcome. And, and the fact that there are more activities that allow them to physically express themselves, I think, enhances their overall educational outcome. And that's been proved every time they've looked at it in studies. Just, I have two children, one is in ninth grade and one's in 11th grade, and there's no doubt in my mind that having an extra gym is necessary. I think it's one of the main priorities that was pulled and why it still remains on the priority list. I think the first answer, Title IX, you know, women playing sports, teams, activities, you can't compare 1969 with 2018. There's just, there's no comparison in terms of, think about the doubling, literally the sports program doubling with Title IX. The other I don't have the answer for is I know the middle school edition was in 2004, 2005. I don't actually know where we educated our 7th and 8th graders before they came to this building. I do know that the 2014 proposal originally had a middle school gym specifically as opposed to the gym that they located, which I think is in a better location now than the original design, but even then there was clearly a need to how do you address now these middle schoolers together with high schoolers, and so I think that also may explain, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but that might also explain uh, the increased demand on space. And it's, it's not necessarily a new need, but when the 04 edition was done in the original proposal, there, they, there was a gym in it, and it was kind of one of those things right about where we're at now. You know, they didn't think it was going to pass. They needed to knock millions off it. And the one item that could be easily pulled out was the gym, so they pulled it out and went ahead with the project, got the space they needed, because at the time, there was a, a spike of, of enrollment. We had about three years where we had these really large classes coming through. And, um, and we needed the space to get through. That was the main priority, but we've kind of been regretting ever since not doing that then. Well, that was one of the big things in the retention division. <coughs> they went through um, struggles with their one gym, and I went to school there. Um, and you know, the, the new gym has freed up their schedule. It's, it's given them flex space. When one gym goes down, they still have the other space to put their activities in. I'm not sure there's another combined middle high school in the area that doesn't have a separate space for physical activity. Um, um. Probably won't find one. Another thing with the gym is that they've, they've smartly put it in an area where it could be on the, on the weekend and be used by community groups and be given community could be given access to it to use without giving them access to the entire building. You could just lock a couple double doors and give them access to that portion. So it, it's really also trying to give the community more access and use that space on like Sundays and on the weekend and groups that aren't school group. Right now our current gym is so tied up with our own school programs it's seldom ever available for the community to schedule for something. Um, it, that's outside of the school day. During the school day, you know, people contact me to schedule it, and I, I get so many requests from <coughs> teachers that want to do this, want to do that, um, and um, we don't we don't really have the gym is so tied up with our own phys ed programming during the day. It's very difficult for us, you know, when we do something like. You know, I, I love the Fine Arts Festival, and I, I, I'll, I'll support it, but, you know, if it rains, Fine Arts Festival week, and, you know, basically what we do is we take all those sections of PE, and we just go outside, rain or shine, so that the gym can become a, a, a you know, an art museum during, during that week, and um, there's definitely been years where it rains the whole time and it's, and it's kind of tough. We, we sometimes end up just going and just being patrons of the arts during our classes. <laughs> <laughs> and it interrupts, it, it for the week totally interrupts, you know, phys ed classes in our programs. So um, there, a gym gets used for a lot more as well. Assemblies, special events, 
we could do a lot more of those kinds of things. The American Red Cross off, you know, um, the blood drives there, they would like to do it more often during the hours when we're having school. We try to work, you know, we try to support them as much as we can, but we kind of have to remember, well, these times, these times, because it's just too much impact on our, our classes to give up the space and not have phys ed classes in there. So having more space would increase our ability to uh, accommodate those kinds of requests and support other things the community wants to use the space for. Yes. Um, how is the library utilized now, and how do you envision it being utilized when this is done? So um, the funny thing is, is that between last year and this year, we have uh, already changed in some ways um, how we utilize our library. Right now, um, it's certainly, um, it's at the back of the building um, with not a lot of light and it's kind of tucked away. Um, and this year we started something called the uh, Learning Commons model. And so um, we, and it was, it's really hard to do when, you know, we are vying for classroom space and things like that. But there are classrooms that are flanking the library that we have turned into uh, labs for students. Mm -hmm. So we have a literacy lab, a math lab, and an executive functioning lab or habits of work lab. Um, that students can be assigned to or can drop in to get extra support in those specific areas. And there is a special educator, a general educator, and a paraeducator based on what their need is to really attend to the student. And so trying to make it a place where it is a hive of learning, that is a flexible space for students to access um, regularly, drop in, um, and really wanting to create a vision for the school where the library and that learning commons is the center of the school and everything kind of flows from there, um, which has really transformed um, a lot of inclusion, a lot of, you know, it's, we have students, you know, in AP classes stopping by for, extra, for support with writing and students who might need a, you know, basic reading intervention working alongside with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really that, that incredibly inclusive um, part of the school and would love to be able to really shore that up in a way that achieves the vision we were hoping for, um, but we're trying to just limp along with the space that we currently have. And the library move is cost neutral. You know, when you're doing this much work, move, moving the library and the reconfiguration of space is really cost neutral at that point. So it's exciting that it really doesn't come at much of an additional cost at all to be able to achieve that vision. Sure. Okay. I'd like to get you guys home before spring really gets here. <laughs> so, <laughs> are there any other questions? Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you all for coming out tonight and all the great questions. <laughs>